This special presentation was produced in high definition by WEDU, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota. Rescue, rehabilitate, protect. That's the mission of Big Cat Rescue, one of the largest accredited sanctuaries in the world dedicated to abused and abandoned big cats. Learn more about Big Cat Rescue and its work in ending the abuse of these majestic wild animals. And find out about how their Bobcat Rehab Program is helping to keep Florida's wild cat population thriving. That's coming up next. Welcome to Up Close, I'm Kathy Unruh. Founded in 1992, Big Cat Rescue advocates for exotic big cats at many levels. The sanctuary provides a home for cats that have been rescued, rehabilitates animals that have been injured, and works to end the abuse of these animals through education and legislation to end private possession and trade in exotic cats. Big Cat Rescue is now home to more than 80 exotic big cats, including many species that are threatened, endangered, or even extinct in the wild. We are joined today by Jamie Veronica. She is president of Big Cat Rescue and chair of the volunteer committee. Also with us is Susan Bash. She is director of public relations at BCR. Thank you both for being here today. Let's start at the beginning, 1992. What led to the founding of Big Cat Rescue? The sanctuary was founded by my mother, and um, she rescued a group of small bobcat kittens, and we just kind of went headfirst into the business, and we've made a lot of changes and progressed through the years to what we are today, which is a sanctuary uh, with the goal of ending the private ownership of big cats. Because your mom was really surprised. She went to buy a couple of bobcat kittens, found out they were all going to be used for fur, brought 56, if I remember correctly. Correct. 56 baby bobcats. Huh? Yes. So she, she got started in a big way, and it was a lot of hard work, but totally worth it. And um, we're just... Uh, we're excited to where we're going now. I mean, we're really making a big difference for cats all over the country. And we're going to talk about as much of that as we possibly can. But one thing that we totally want to point out is that there is no breeding that happens at Big Cat. Right. A true sanctuary does not buy, breed, sell, or interact with their uh, exotic animals. And there was some at the beginning that was part of the education process, learning along the way. It's been a big learning curve for everybody. Yeah, we had to, we had a big learning curve because back when we started, there wasn't uh, the amount of information available at your fingertips on the internet like there is today. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, led down the wrong path, unfortunately, in the beginning, but we've learned uh, through our mistakes, trial and error, and now we've come 360 degrees around and are working to end the, the exploitation of these cats. And Susan, we mentioned that there are about 80 cats in residence right now. They live in what are called catatats. Not habitats, <laughs> but catatats. Tell us about the catatats, the size of them, how much room is mean, needed for cats in the acreage of the entire sanctuary. Sure. We have about 70 acres at Big Cat Rescue. And right now we have about 80 exotic cats. We have everything from the big ones, the lions and tigers, down to the little ones like the bobcats and ocelots and caracals, which we're getting soon. And um, they all have huge enclosures. We have all of their enclosures in certain sections. Everyone has at least two sections. We never touch the cats, as Jamie pointed out. So in order to go in and maybe fix an enclosure or do some weeding or move a platform around, we can safely close the cats into one section of their area while the keepers go in and work on the other side. We say huge, and that can be up to two and a half acres? Exactly. The individual enclosures where they live are up to about an acre and even the smaller cats have at least 1200 square feet which is about the size of a small house and we have two vacation areas just like people animals get bored they want to see something new it's mentally stimulating for them to actually go and get different um, areas to check out new territory to mark new pools to swim in tigers love to swim so it's got a big pond and we have a large one that's two and a half acres for our lions and tigers and then we have a smaller one that we call funcation for the leopards and the cougars and the smaller cats. And the reasoning for never touching the animals is? 
Uh, we don't interact with the animals because they, they're wild animals. They're dangerous and unpredictable, and we don't want to put ourselves, our staff, or our volunteers in harm's way. And you want to leave them as natural as possible. They would not be touching humans themselves Absolutely. out in the wild. But you mentioned that they are stimulated by going to vacation spots, and so. They, but they also get lots of other intellectual and physical stimulation on a daily basis. Yeah, we have a, uh, a whole team, our enrichment team, that thinks up new fun toys for the cats to play with, and they give them enrichment every day. That's just something that's uh, different, that's added to their enclosure to give them something new and exciting to, to investigate. It might be something like a ball or it might be something new and different to eat, those sorts of things, right? Yeah, they really like, um, we do a lot of temporary toys, which is like uh, paper bags or cardboard boxes with perfumes or spices on them to give them something different to smell. And some of the animals do live alone, but some live with companions. Yes, we most of our cats live alone. They're solitary by nature. Mm -hmm. um, the, we have a few pairs that were raised together from a very young age. Uh, those are, of course, uh, spayed and neutered so that we're not having any breeding there. But we do try to keep uh, pairs together when they come to us that way. Susan, what are some of the reasons that big cats come to the sanctuary? They come to us for a number of reasons. Some have been saved from being fur coats. Others have been rescued from private owners that realize that these cats do not make good pets and they would like to no longer have them. Some are seized by authorities. It seems in the last few years we get a lot more that have been seized by authorities or um, because they're situations. in abusive situations. Exactly right. For example, a few years ago we rescued three tigers from a horrible place that had lost its USDA license in New York City, or actually New York, not the city you know they were they'd been starved at the woman had quit feeding them and they had eye problems one of the tigers was missing most of her tail uh, just a bunch of problems she probably never gotten vet care when what we believe happened was a lion that lived next door to her had probably pulled it off or bit it off so they come from a number of situations including um, orphans when their parents are killed yes that's true um, and you hear about these from all different avenues from around the country because you're so well known now. But when you need to go get cats to bring them to the sanctuary, how are they transported? Um, when we go on a rescue, we have a rescue trailer and we'll take that to wherever the location is. It's fully outfitted with uh, air conditioning and surveillance cameras inside the trailer so that we can monitor the animals during transport. And you often personally drive them? Yes, uh, I manage all of our rescues. So I'll usually pick a small group of uh, our big cat rescuers, which are our volunteer and staff, to go with us um, depending on the situation. Sometimes we have uh, very complicated rescues where we are going into uh, maybe not so safe conditions. Other times we are going to um, a place where maybe the authorities have already seized the animals and they're being held in a secure location. So each rescue is very different. And not every animal who comes to VCR stays there for their entire lifetime. Some are released. Right. Uh, all of the cats that were born in captivity um, that came from private hands stay there permanently. But we do have a bobcat rehab and release program where we take native Florida bobcats that have been injured or perhaps orphaned and we'll rehabilitate them, get them ready to go back into the wild, and then we'll release them. Why do you feel that the Bobcat Rehab Program is so important to you? The Bobcat Rehab Program is my uh, most favorite part of what we do out there because we get these cats from all over the country that have been in sad situations and we give them a much better life um, but they're still not going back to the wild. So being able to take an animal that was from the wild give it the care that it needs to go back and let it back into its natural habitat is just the most rewarding experience. How do you get the bobcats? What's, what has happened to them that they need rehab and what does the rehab involve? The main cause for uh, the bobcats coming into our rehab program is strikes by cars. So when we got a lot of development going on in an area, sometimes the bobcats are on the move, going to different locations, and unfortunately they may get hit. Um, the same uh, happens with uh, orphans. Sometimes their mothers may get hit by cars, leaving uh, orphaned kittens that can't take care of themselves. So we'll get calls um, that an injured bobcat is on the side of the road, or sometimes somebody may 
bring a kitten into a veterinary clinic and we'll go all over the state to pick them up and bring them. Because to bobcats can be found anywhere. They live in the swamps, they live in the suburbs, they basically live all over the state. Right. And there's a pretty healthy population. That, uh, we believe that their numbers are quite high. There's no um, studies on their exact population density. Um, but they do live all over the state and can live in as small an area as two square miles. Do you know how many you have rescued and released thus far? We have had over 30 bobcats come through the rehab program. And people can actually watch the bobcats through webcams if they'd like to. Yes, we have uh, several cameras throughout the sanctuary that are live streaming 24-7 on explore.org. And two of those cameras are in our bobcat rehabilitation enclosures. And part of the reason you're doing this is to raise public awareness because you want to grow this program further, correct, Susan? Exactly. In fact, we are in the middle of expanding the bobcat rehab area right now. It used to be in a smaller section of the sanctuary that was sort of near the tour path. And we don't, of course, want these cats to imprint with people. We want them to be safe when they are released because if they're friendly towards people, they're not going to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. They'll walk right up to someone and that person won't understand that they've actually, you know, not a not a wild-ish bobcat. So uh, Jamie and Carol and everyone have actually built a huge new area that's on the other side of the sanctuary. And we have four long runs. They're 230 feet by what, 30 feet wide? And um, that's a spot where the bobcats can be rehabbed. And we have one little bobcat, Nova, who's currently going through the rehab program right now. And this has been funded by donations, as is most of your work, mm -hmm. is donations. Um, but you also want to raise more money to increase the bobcat program even further? Uh, we are uh, raising some funds right now to have a building near our rehab enclosures where if a bobcat is recovering from surgery, they can be housed indoors in smaller quarters until they're ready to go outside. Now, you take in lots of, of, of animals who need rehab, but is a bobcat especially close to your heart because it's Florida? or um, I think bobcats are uh, just totally impressive. They have such big personalities for such a small cat. They can be uh, 15 to 20 pounds full grown, but they can act like they're lions in their personality. Now part of your mission is to educate people that having big cats as pets is not acceptable, not a good idea. How do you do that? We do that a number of ways. With the advent of social media in the last decade or so, we've really been able to spread our message across the world. We have followers that follow our Facebook page, our Twitter, our Instagram, from every country imaginable. And they get really involved. As the PR person, part of my work is the advocacy. And so I get all the calls and the emails and, and the uh, texts from people saying, you know, oh, I was just at this fair and someone's got tiger cubs that they're allowing people to pet for $20. And tell us why it's not a good idea to have them as pets or show pieces. It's definitely not a good idea. These are wild animals and in captivity there are a number of breeders who simply breed these cats for a very short shelf life when they're under 12 weeks old to be able to charge them, charge people to hold them and take photos or give them a bottle, etc. And then once they're past that age, they're too dangerous and their teeth are sharp for, you know, a little child to be holding a cub. And yet in captivity, they can live to be over 20 years old. So there's a constant speed breeding of these tigers by the breeders so that they have a constant supply of cubs. And no one knows what happens to these cats once, they, once they've outlived their usefulness as a photo prop. They end up being discarded or sold to roadside zoos or given to people who have no idea what they're doing with a kitten or a cub. And sometimes we don't know, but we're sure they get, get euthanized, sold to canned hunts. It's just not a good idea. The one thing we always tell people is if you want to help the big cat situation, captive big cats in America, the best thing to do is to never pay to hold a cub. And we have a whole website devoted to that, cubtruth.com, if people want to learn more. And besides the education, you're also working on legislation. That's a very important focus. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the legislation, legislative efforts. <laughs> right. We have a bill that's currently pending right now in the House, and this is a federal bill, so it will impact all 50 states. Right now, there's a patchwork of laws from state to state, and there are still four states that have zero laws. It's easier in some states to actually go out and buy a tiger cub than it is to go to Humane Society and adopt a 
puppy or a kitten, believe it or not. So what would the federal legislation do? What it will do is it will phase out the private ownership of these cats. It's estimated there's between 10 and 20,000 big cats living in deplorable conditions, languishing in people's backyards here throughout America. That's amazing. What would the legislation do to make that stop? It would say you can no longer breed cats if you own them, and you can no longer, if you're at a roadside zoo, you can no longer let the public have direct contact with the cubs, which we believe will stop a lot of the breeding. If breeders can't make money by breeding these cubs, there goes their incentive. So the legislation is a first step on what your ultimate goal is, which is to end the propagation of wildcats for any kind of commercial or domestic purpose. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So you're doing an incremental. I know you've been working on legislation over the years. It's mm -hmm. a huge focus. So it's step by step by step to what's the dream vision in the end? Our goal is to put ourselves out of business. We don't want there to be a need for sanctuaries for animals that have been abused or abandoned. So our, our main purpose is to stop the, the causes of that. And I think, Susan, you wanted to share that people can help if anybody's watching and want to help because you're particularly concerned at this time about a couple of cases. Exactly. If, if um, you want to, it's a great way to do it. You can just text CATS, C-A-T-S, to 52886, and that will get a text back to you, which will explain what we call the call of the wild. And anywhere around the country, someone can automatically reach their house representative in Washington, D.C., and let them know, you know, I don't want to see these cats owned as private pets and exploited as cubs for photo ops, so I'd like you to pass the Big Cat Public Safety Act. And I have to point out that there are people who disagree strongly with you. You encounter them all the time. So we are presenting the one point of view. But there are people who are like, hey, this is fine. Right. Those people are mainly making money off of having the tiger cubs. There's one breeder, he um, boasted on his Facebook page a few years ago that he used to take tiger cubs to a mall for five days at a time. And in five days, he made over $20,000. And if you charge 10 or $20 every time someone holds a cub, which should still be with its mother for the first two years, and is tired and trying to sleep, that's a lot of time and a lot of money made on these back of these cubs. Working at the sanctuary seems like it would be a very exciting and thrilling job but as we've already discussed there's no touching the animals you guys are not holding any cubs what are the roles of the staff there what are the various jobs um, the staff mainly do uh, administrative work and management uh, <coughs> of our different programs all of the animal care is done by our volunteers and our interns at any given time we have up to 20 interns that live three months at a time on the property and we have about a hundred volunteers in our volunteer program and these are people that may have a background in animal care or people that just want something different and exciting to do so what kind of training is involved? Do you just come and say, I'd, I'd like to work with the cats? <laughs> we have a lot of people that, that contact us asking if they can come work with the cats. Um, what we require is that they come on a tour of the sanctuary to kind of get an idea of what our mission is because we want to be on the same page as, as the people that are coming to work at the sanctuary. Um, and then we have a very intensive program, lots of training classes. There's several different levels of volunteer. Um, so someone can spend as little is four hours a week up to 10 hours a week volunteering out there and there's just um, a lot of really good classes that we give people so that they are able to work around the animals and be safe and you're very experienced in this area because you're a certified wildlife rehab person tell me what your exact title or your certificate is um, I'm a wildlife rehabber with the state of Florida under Big Cat Rescue so that's the Bobcat rehab program that we have there but I also have um, pretty much a lifetime of experience being around the animals and one of the things you do is photography you have won awards for your photography and you also use that to make life better for the animals how yeah um, photography is definitely one of my many hobbies um, but I use the photos that of the cats to um, share on social media on our website just to um, get the word out as wide as possible to people all over the country about the cats and their plight here in captivity and your social media you've mentioned but it's truly true amazing when you go on your website you have just a plethora of information if you had to pick what's the message that we most want to get out to people what is it 
our main message is that the animals belong in the wild, so um, they shouldn't be in captive hands, and the animals that are in the wild, we should be protecting habitat uh, in order to keep them there. And are you always looking for more volunteers? We are always looking for volunteers and interns. They are the, the core of the sanctuary out there, and we depend on them greatly. And are you trying to grow the sanctuary more in the future? I mean, the acreage has expanded over time. Is there still room to grow? We have uh, more space at the sanctuary, but our uh, main goal is the legislation. So we're keeping the number of animals that we have at a, at a steady number. Um, so we're not planning any new um, enclosures or expanding the number of animals anytime soon. Which means that you need to make decisions when you get these kinds of calls that animals need to be rescued from this and such a place for thus and such a reason. How do you make those decisions? Every time we get a call for a rescue, we sit down and go over a whole bunch of details. Do we have the enclosure space? Do we have the funds to take care of that animal for the rest of its life? We um, plan out ahead every cat that we take in that we have those funds in our reserves. If something were to happen tomorrow and we weren't able to collect donations anymore for some reason. So we don't want to um, basically rescue ourselves out of business, which happens a lot. We can't just depend on that next rescue to fund what we're doing now. Um, three cats from Ohio are the most recent example. Of yes, uh, the three cats from Ohio, uh, two caracals and a serval. So we have to look at the, the cage space that we have and the number of volunteers that we have at that level that can provide the care for those animals. Caracal, that's one that we don't toss around. What's a caracal? A uh, caracal is a, uh, it's also called a desert lynx. Um, they're just a small, probably 35 pound cat kind of reddish in color with really long black ears. And do you work with other organizations, other sanctuaries, other zoos, other organizations at all on the preservation of species? Uh, we support a number of conservation programs all over the world. Uh, one of the ways we celebrate our volunteers each month is to select a volunteer that's really been outstanding in their service, and then we donate $1,000 in their name to a conservation project uh, somewhere around the world. Uh, we also do a... Uh, fundraiser each year that we call our Wildcat Walkabout, and that's a whole event where people can come and walk around the sanctuary, and the main goal of it is to raise funds for at least five different conservation programs. And you can take tours pretty much any time at Big Cat, yes? Yes, we're open every day except Thursday. Generally, our tours are at 3 p.m. during the week, and it's for uh, children 10 and over, as well as adults. And then on the weekends, we have tours, the kids' tour, we call it, that a family would go on if they have children with them who are nine years old or younger. And on the tour, you get to see... You get to see a lot of the cats. I always say we are a sanctuary, so the cats come first. The cats you're going to see as you walk around are the cats that want to be seen right then. They all have the opportunity to go in their dens or lounge in the back of their enclosures or hide in the foliage, so they're not you know, on display per se. But you've got an educated or experienced guide taking you around. We don't allow people to walk around on their own. So they have a guided one-and-a-half-hour walking tour and learn about the cats their individual stories and the plight of captive cats in America and also what's going on with wild cats. And is this a representative thing for people on your tours because your sanctuary is different than many? So you say they learn about the plight of wild cats in America. Do you also introduce them to this is not how it is everywhere for every cat? We do. It, it depends on, on the situation, but yes, we go through you know what's going on, especially with the captive cats and the fact that no one even knows how many captive big cats there are in America. Scary as that is, there's no government agency that even keeps track. And some of the things we're trying to do to change that. So what's on the future goal, list of goals? I know where you want to get to to the end, but what are next steps? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, we're just, we kind of take it a day at a time out there. We have our main, our big goals, but um, we deal with the rehab bobcats that come through the doors as needed and rescue calls that we get. Um, our main goals around the sanctuary are um, just to keep the grounds really uh, in pristine condition and make sure all the cats are happy on a daily basis. For anybody who hasn't been there, I find it amazing where the sanctuary is located because you drive down a city street, not a city, but a neighborhood, it, you know, it's a residential area, and then you make a turn and boom, you're in the sanctuary. How did that happen? Uh, 
Uh, we actually started out there uh, in the 90s, and we were the only thing out there. It was a bunch of hay fields, um, and the, I think the closest store was a couple miles away. Now we have the Vet Veterans Expressway on one side of us and a mall across the street from us. So it's really the development has just come up all around the sanctuary, leaving uh, a little bit of paradise in the middle. And it's called Easy Street, which is a, a very appropriate name for. Um, any final thoughts that you want to leave with our viewers about what they could do to help or how to educate themselves more on this issue? We have an amazing website. If people go to BigCatRescue.org, they can read about the different issues. They can learn about becoming a volunteer or an intern, different things that we're doing, You know how to stop uh, others and how to help educate others about not petting cubs. So really everything's there. And as I mentioned, if they want to get involved with the Call of the Wild, they can text 52886-CATS. Okay. Jamie? Um, I think I think we covered pretty much everything okay. in such a short amount of time. Well, thank you both for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank and you. for more information about Big Cat Rescue, or if you're interested in visiting the sanctuary or volunteering, you can visit BigCatRescue.org. This episode of Up Close may be viewed in its entirety at WEDU.org. Thanks for watching. I'm Kathy Andrew, and I will see you next time on Up Close.